Come on, stand to your feet. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit. We thank you that today we come to listen to the teacher of the church who's not a man, nor is it a woman, but it's the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. This day we say not only bless us, but we want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire and around the planet that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may be doing things differently. They may have different type of worship services. They may, you know, do different traditions and ceremonial rituals and things like that. But, you know, Lord, there are brothers and our sisters. And we may not do it their way. They don't do it our way. But there are brothers and our sisters. And we ask you to bless them, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say. Amen. Go ahead, take your seat, go with me to Hebrews the 11th chapter once again. In Hebrews the 11th chapter, it's a wonderful time where God is wrapping up the 11th chapter and he makes a statement about all of these people of great faith. This is the, as I mentioned earlier, the, if you will, hall of faith for God. Mentioning certain people that have done phenomenal things. May I say this to you? It is not. Listen closely. It is not a history lesson. You, you know, God's, you're not going to go to heaven. God says, do you know this? Do you know that? And he says, wow, you're really smart. You get an A in history. This is not some little Sunday school classroom, you know, where you learn about the children of Israel and you learn about their march through the wilderness and all that. Everything in the Old Testament speaks of spiritual things in the New Testament. In other words, they are examples physically of something we, the church, should learn spiritually. So their physical activity in those days were not just cute little stories, but they were really the hidden mysteries, the insight that God was to point the way for you and I to see the truth that God has so we can operate by it. And we fail to understand that. We fail to recognize that. We fail as a church to see the importance of what God is saying and what God wants to do. And so today as I read these verses, I'm going to make some points to you that are really fascinating. I want you to listen up this morning because here it is, verse number 32, because we're talking about something called humble faith. And I, I love this, humble faith. Humble faith means you're incredibly dependent on God. That's the, that's the, this is part number four and you're dependent. I need to be dependent on God for everything. I don't know if you are or not, but if you're dependent on God to come through for you, man, that's humble faith and all of us should be in that kind of a spot. Verse number 32, he makes this statement under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah. Also of David and Samuel and the prophets, verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms and worked righteousness, obtaining promises, stopping the mouths of lions, verse 34, quenching the violence of the of, uh, of fire, escaping the edge of the sword out of wickedness, uh, were made strong, became uh, become uh, violent in, in, in battle, valiant in battle, turning to fight the uh, armies of the aliens. There's a one word here that you've got to see that is amazing in this particular verse 34. Out of weakness they were made strong. Of everything that I just read to you, the most important single word is this one word, made. Every person that God has as a hall of faith, every person that God is describing as doing something absolutely phenomenal that caught the attention of God, oh my, how would you like to catch the attention of God? Do things that are phenomenal beyond your own ability. Every single person is summarized in that little verse right there. Out of weakness, we're all, not talking about one person, talking about all of them. All of them. 
He's talking about all of them from, the, from verse number one right on through. Out of their weakness, they were, here's the one word, made strong. In other words, guys, can I tell you something? God's going to take you in your weakness, frailties, in your past failures, in your screw-ups, in your lack of ability, lack of, uh, of talent, lack of education, and lack of financial resources, and lack of family background, and can take you to a place in your weakness, to a place of strength, to do great, mighty, marvelous things. And that's for every single one of us that's in here. And that in itself is like, you got to be kidding me. That he would define these great men and women of God as weak. But he made them strong. Here's a question. Will you, in your life, make him strong? Or will you stay in your own power and in that weakness? It's your call. It's your, it's your call. And that's what this is really all about. Going back to verse number 32, there's this guy that pops out in verse 32. His name is Jephthah. Most of you, if I asked you to raise your hand, have absolutely, you know David, you know Moses, you know Jesus, you know Paul, Peter, James, John, Jephthah. But yet I find that Jephthah is right there in that verse. He could have named so many, and he didn't, like Daniel. Didn't name Daniel, didn't name Isaiah, didn't name all, all the others, but Jephthah comes out as somebody. And over the years, there's been a great debates about Jephthah. Not many people have ever taught about Jephthah, and that's kind of sad, if I can tell you the truth, because his life is quite amazing, as you're going to see today. I find, I find it interesting, as I was meditating and thinking and talking to the Holy Spirit, preparing to chat with you as God was talking to me, that I found the life of Jephthah that he actually did not, hear me now, I'm going to say it again, did not, hear one more time, did not do anything that is as great as the others. It was like, God, why is his name there if he didn't do anything as great as the others? And then... All of a sudden, there was one outstanding point that was so outstanding, it caught the heart and eye of God, and God spends about a chapter and a half plus mention in the New Testament, this one man's name that none of us know, which means if you don't know it, you've overlooked it when you ought to join the Bible college. Here's my point. If there's some things to show you about the life of Jephthah that'll change your life, open the doors, and cause you to be healthy and strong and prosperous and blessed, wouldn't you want that? I mean, stop and really think about it. You, you have your life ahead of you. Grandpa's talking to you right now. Most of you are young. Most of you, I've, I've been a senior pastor longer than you have lived. That's, I mean, I, I, I've been a senior pastor s since the covered wagons came out here from there. <laughs> well, almost, I lied a little bit. And I'm here to tell you something. Wouldn't you want something? Wouldn't you want to, listen to this, tap into the heart of God? I mean, not very many people can tap into the desire and plan and will and direction of God because if you get the de desire, plan and will of God you, you've got everything of every value that the world could ever ask of you wouldn't you want that? well I want it for you too there's four things I'm going to show you about Jephthah these four things are all fascinating but one out of the four is outstanding. That I just know got his name in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Go with me, if you will, into Judges. Judges, the 11th chapter. If you're trying to find Judges and you don't know quite where it is, it's double J, which means Joshua Judges. 
And then Ruth, and then 1 Samuel. If you got to Ruth or 1 Samuel, went too far, going back, if you will, between Joshua. Everybody that has a Bible in here, I want you to raise your hand with your Bible in it right now. Mark it in your place. Put your Bible in the air right now. Put your Bible in the air right now. Put your Bible in the air right now. Just your Bible, okay? Even if it's a device, I want to see it in the air. Okay, now, everybody that doesn't have a hand up, everybody that doesn't have a hand up, I want you to applaud these people for bringing their Bible. Come on. Thank you for doing that. And every one of you that you can get a Bible, you should have a Bible. And, you should, and whether it's electrical or techno, technical Bible, I don't care. Well, I don't, it doesn't make one bit of difference to start getting the Word of God where you can have easy access to it. That's the point. Now, Jeff, the first point, I'm going to give you the point, And then I'm going to read you the verses. And I'm going to explain the verses. And then I'm going to show you how it relates with you so that you can understand. Simple as that. Are you ready? First verse, and here's the first, if you will, first point on understanding this character, Jephthah. Rejection is not the end to him. Let me just say it again, and I put it up on the overhead for you. You need to make a note of that. Rejection is not the end of his life. Rejection didn't stop him. Rejection didn't hinder him from becoming great. Rejection didn't define his future. In fact, if I could put this little slogan up, I will. He doesn't let the declarations of the past declare the destiny of his future. You ought to write that down and make it part of your heart. He doesn't make the declarations of the past to declare the destiny of his future. He doesn't give up. Here's the next one that I like. He doesn't give up on God because people gave up on him. And we in the church of America do it all the time. I'm here to tell you, you live in a world of rejection. People don't like you. People, you have no idea. People made promises to you and they've never followed through with them. They said, oh, uh, uh, till death do us part, I'll love you forever. And after a few years, they're gone. You have had people after people after people, fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, children, bosses, for best friends. You have had it over the years that define who you are. And if you don't get past the negative rejections of this world, you'll never have a future in God. And so I read to you now the verses out of Joshua, the 11th chapter. Verse number one. Excuse me, out of Judges, the 11th chapter. Verse number one, now Jephthah, the Gilead, was a mighty man of valor. Did you see the words mighty man of valor? That means he has mm, lots of money, very wealthy family that he's connected to. In fact, his dad is known for this whole area to be named after him. Powerful man. When you see that in the Bible, you've got to learn that's not just saying, well, you know, he, that means he's got, he's got the bucks. But, the biggest little word in the Bible right here besides the word if, is the word but. He was born to a harlot, a prostitute of that day. I don't know what prostitutes were like. I presume they're a lot like today's prostitutes. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're just not what you want to take home to mom. And it says he was born to a harlot. And Gilead, who's his father, begot Jephthah. And verse number two starts to get interesting. And Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall, not have no, you shall have no inheritance of our father's house. For you are the son of another woman. I, I have a hard time saying, I have a hard time believing these guys were that polite and said you are the son of another woman. 
You know what I'm talking about. And that's really what he was. And he says these words, they drove him out. You can't have it. They cut him off. You're of a hooker. Your mother was a prostitute. Not only is that an insult to his mother, not only is that an insult to his life, not only all the things that he's grown up with, not only is he part of the father, none of that makes any difference whatsoever. They threw him out. He's completely 100% rejected, thrown out. Some of you have been that way. Rejected by people. And you've let the rejection of those people hinder your choices and decisions in life stopping your future because you started to even believe what they said about you is anybody listening verse number three it's fascinating it goes on in verse three it says and Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob worthless men band together with Jethro in other words these guys are tough ra raiders Worthless men mean these guys were the ones that were running from the tax collectors. They didn't go along with everything in life. They were a mess. And notice what it says. He says, uh, these worthless men, they, and they went out and raided with him. In other words, he became their boss. Raiding means that's how they made their living. They went to the enemy's camps, took what they needed, brought it back, and sold it. That's the way it worked. Right or wrong, that's the way it worked in those days. So we see this man who's overcoming in a moment this rejection. And he has this horrible, horrible rejection. But he makes a choice, as you'll see in a minute, to follow God and to be a godly man and to be a great warrior and a strategic military person and becomes, in the Bible, a famous person. Now watch this for a second. My dad, most of you don't know my dad, some of you remembered my dad. My dad uh, died when he was uh, 81. And uh, he was born in the turn of the last century. I'll just tell you a little story about him. He was turn of the last century in the San Francisco area. And uh, my grandmother was married to my dad's stepfather. My dad's stepfather was a very cruel and abusive man that hated my father, hated my father. And literally my father had disformed parts of his feet because my, that father-in-law uh, for my father was so abusive. His feet were all crumbled and broken in. And my father was thrown out at age nine years old in the streets of San Francisco. Nine years old. At nine years old, he had, at the turn of the last century, had no place to live, no clothes, no mom, no dad, no house, had nothing. Totally and completely rejected was my dad. He made way eating out of garbage cans and working hard and shining shoes and did whatever he could and People took advantage of him and beat him up and everything. And he grew up to be in his early teens and he said to himself, I can either be like my stepdad who was bad or I can be a great man and take care of my family. He didn't know how to do that. But someday he said, I want to have a family. I want to be a good dad, not a bad dad because I know what a bad dad's like. Some of you are in here right now. You know what a bad dad's like. And that choice that you're going to have to make is either let the rejection penetrate you or you over, operate over and above that. And I'm here to tell you, without any education, became one of the top executives in American and major corporations. He was a great father who loved me and my brother and held us at night and encouraged us. I'm spoiled because, and I'm a product of his love to this day. All because he would not allow rejection to overcome his future. You oftentimes have let rejections of the past overcome your future. When I was a boy in high school, I liked to play a lot. My mind always operated faster than where they were going and teaching. And I was junior high, high school area. I'll never forget this. I... One teacher grabbed my paper away from me and she said, Jim, she says, you're so stupid, you're like a plant. 
You probably have an IQ of a plant. And the whole class just roared and roared and roared. And I thought it was funny too because I got to make everybody laugh. <laughs> and then she says, no, shut up you guys. It's not a plant. His IQ is as low as an amoeba. That's lower than a plant. Well, she got her science in for that day and everybody learned something, but <laughs> it broke my heart. And I always thought of myself as somebody who couldn't do and accomplish anything. I certainly couldn't study, I certainly couldn't read, I couldn't grab a hold of principles or anything. I, and then, all of a sudden, God got into my life. And now I teach Greek and Hebrew all over the world as a theologian. Oh my goodness, and I teach the Bible. You can either let your past define your future or you can rise with Jesus when you're weak. He makes you. Let's try that again. When you're weak, he makes you. One more time. When you're weak, he makes you. You're going to be weak. You're going to be rejected. But it's not the end because you got him. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a great big praise. Second thing I want to share with you today, and this is important for you to hear is vengeance, vindication, and sorry, vindication and promotion come from God. In other words, <clears throat> you may be down, out, never thought you could ever do anything, and you're so angry at somebody who's rejected you that you want to have vindication, and then you want to prove your vindication by your promotion. Whew. But I'm here to tell you, vindication is the Lord's. And promotion comes from God, not because you're so smart or cute or clever or talented or gifted. It comes from God. And oftentimes we forget that. And we become ourselves as a people who try to vindicate ourselves. You don't have to vindicate yourself at all. God will promote you. Is anybody listening to you? And it's so important to see this because we fail to see it all the time. Listen, if I may read to you, starting in verse number four. And it came to pass that after a time of the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was when the people of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead, remember Gilead was from his tribe, went to get Je uh, Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our commander. What? Let me read that again. I must have read it wrong. Remember, vindication is God's. Promotion comes from God. He's doing what he knows to do. That's what you and I need to do in times of trouble, in times of un understand, lack of understanding. And God brings the vindication and God brings the promotion. Is anybody listening? He's come and be our commander that we may fight against the people of, I of Ammon. Those are the enemies of Israel. In verse number seven, so uh, Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me? And expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you're in distress? The elders, thank goodness they're honest, verse 8. And the elders of Gilead said, that's why we have turned again to you now, that you may go and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of, of Gilead. And be the head? And be the head? All of the inhabitants? You're, I'm the boss? In other words, you take me from nothing, thrown out, rejected, no inheritance, to be now the boss of the entire group? <laughs> I like this, don't you? Vindication. Promotion comes from God. And he says these words, verse number nine, and Jephthah said to the elders, if you take me back home to fight against the people of Ammon, and the Lord delivers them to me, shall I be your head? Are you telling me I'm going to be the boss? Is what he just said. Verse 10, and the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do according 
to your words. It's exactly what we're saying is what they said. I remember a guy named Joseph. Anybody remember him in the Bible? It's an awful lot like the same story. For those of you who don't know Joseph, he's born in this great little house. He's got a bunch of brothers. Brothers someday are going to become the call, the children of Israel. But Joseph in those days had a special relationship with his father. His brothers were, if you'll remember, um, just jealous of him and just hated him. He was like one of the younger brothers. And he just, they just hated Joseph because Joseph was really about the things of God. And when you're really about the things of God, get prepared. People won't like you. It's okay. God likes me. I have to make that kind of a choice. I'd much rather have God like me than you like me. Is that not true? And, he, and he, he's really about God, and his brothers don't like him. And here's the story. The story is that his brothers get him out in a wilderness area, and they beat him up, and they throw him down a well. They actually were trying to kill him. He's down there in this well, and they're going back, and they realize that there's a caravan coming, that's on its way to Egypt, and someone says, let's sell him to the caravan as a slave. They grab him out of the well, they sell him to the caravan that's going by, they make a little bit of money, they go tell the dad that he dies, that a lion ate him out in the the wilderness. And now here's Joseph who served God and had a heart for God, finds himself as a slave in Egypt. There in the slave of, as e, in Egypt as a slave, he gets accused of something falsely and ends up in prison. And he's not in prison for a little while. How would you like to serve God? Do nothing wrong. Now watch this. Be rejected by your family. Have people hate you and connive to kill you. Then sell you off in slavery. I mean, things couldn't get worse. When he's a slave in Egypt, he has now been falsely accused and now he's in a prison. I mean, can you imagine what an Egyptian prison must be like in those days? Can you imagine the size of the rats? Can you imagine the size of the human feces? Can you imagine the size and the smell of the urine. Can you imagine the water and the type of food that you would eat in a prison? And he's not there for 30 days and you get out. He's there year after 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 year. year. My goodness sakes, God, where are you? You'd cry that and so would I. Where are you, God? I didn't do anything but follow you. And I'm in prison now. And all of a sudden, the Pharaoh of Egypt, Pharaoh comes and hears something about this guy in prison that makes him different. And the Pharaoh calls him out of prison. He tells the Pharaoh right where he's at and what's ahead of him. And the Pharaoh was so impressed that he makes him the vice minister of all of the land of the Pharaoh. No one was more powerful than Joseph except Pharaoh himself. God just took him from the prison to the palace. And God can do that with you. Because vindication and promotion comes from God. And when you think it's the worst spot and you're not getting anywhere and God isn't even listening, bang, that's when the door is open. Let me just say this to you. His brothers come to him to get food. They don't even recognize him. Why would they? He's dressed like an Egyptian. He's got a robes on. He's glorious. He's got people around him and servants and everything he says, they they jump to attention and his brothers are hurting because they don't have any food and they come to Egypt to get food from the Pharaoh himself and they meet up with Joseph. And Joseph recognizes him. If it was me, (laughs) these suckers are history (laughs) and you know it would have been you too it'd be vindication time 
out and gonna get them. I'll repent later. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? You're right there with me, you know? And it's like, oh my goodness, vindication time. No, he doesn't. Listen to what he says to his brothers after he tells them who they are. They're astonished. They couldn't believe. They were petrified because they thought they were going to get it. In uh, Genesis 45, how about putting up verse, verse number 5? And it says, now, do not therefore be grieved, he's talking to his brother, uh, or angry with yourselves. Not, notice how he said, don't be angry with me. Be angry with yourselves. <laughs> You're the one that screwed up. I didn't. <laughs> yourselves because you sold me here. He makes it very clear. He knows exactly what they did. And they are not one of them saying, well, you know, we, uh, the devil made me do it. <laughs> and he says, for God sent me before you to preserve life. God, see, God had a plan. My friends, you've been rejected. Vindication comes from God. Promotion comes from God. Let me say this to you. God has a plan. And you need to stay faithful to God. Sometimes your prayers don't get answered like you want them to be answered. Sometimes your prayers don't get answered at all. Sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go. Sometimes the world is on you and you say, where's God? Where's God? Just like Joseph. But I want you to know something. He never questioned God. But here's the deal. God wants to bring vindication and promotion to your rejection. And may I say this to you? Nothing greater than that. You ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Number three, I got to go fast because I really want to get to number four. Uh, number three is so important for us to see. And I'll read it to you in just a moment. It only takes one verse. God will take you further than expected. When you get over the intimidation of failure and people's words and rejection by people and all the vile things that happened in your life, and you realize that God is the vindicator and the promoter, and you keep serving God, then God will take you further than you ever dreamt. I remember a time in my life, Deborah and I were pastoring, we were just young, I was in my early 30s, that must have been 100 years ago, for some of you think it is, but I was in my early 30s, Debbie was in her 20s, I think, and um, First time we ever pastored, didn't know anything about pastoring. You know, we're, I, I heard from God. I didn't hear from a denomination. I didn't hear from a committee that says, wow, you know, you could be a pastor of this church. God just said, go pastor. And I said, God, I don't know how to pastor. I don't even know what the word pastor means. I don't know. He says, well, learn. Go pastor. We started this little church. And... I'll never forget it. We were up in Lake Arrowhead. And we had about 75 people coming to church. And I was doing the best job I could to stay alive, take care of and love my wife, provide for my children, and pastor the people. And I'll never forget the time that there was a person that came to me after a church service and said, Pastor, there's a prayer meeting of all the pastors up in the mountain, and are you going? And I said, I hadn't been told. She said, yes, a whole pastor, all the churches in Crestline, Lake Arrowhead, Running Springs are all gathering together at this place, and it's just for pastors, and they're praying for the condition of this mountain. I said, wow, that's great. She says, would you go? I said, of course I'll go. She said, I'll get you the information. Brought me the information and I went. And I remember, and to this day, I still feel it like my father still felt the pain, but got past the pain. I still feel the pain, but I've gotten past the pain. Here's the problem. Some of you still feel the pain. You haven't felt like you've gotten past the problem. And you have to feel the pain. You're not going to get rid of the pain, but you're going to get past it in Jesus. Because that which is weak is made what? Strong. Now watch this. And as I walked in the building with all the pastors sitting around, there were some great pastors there. One of them had the largest church in all the mountains. He had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people on a Sunday. One of them had the greatest education from the greatest seminaries. So all of them had the greatest, if you will, denominations supporting them and backing them and patting them on the back and telling them what to do. And I walked in as a, just a young kid, 
petrified of all of these senior people who are much greater pastors than I'll ever be. And as I sat down, a man across from me who happened to have the largest church and the highest education of all of the pastors, about 25 of them up there, stopped and he looked at me. He says, are you the guy that pastors out there on the rim? I said, yes, my name is Jim Cabray. He says, if you're going to pray with us, I'm leaving. I said, why would you do that? Is, you're leaving? He says, yes, because you're not a real pastor. There's nobody behind you. And I thought to myself, there wasn't. There wasn't any big college that said I went through seminary and gave me a degree. There wasn't, my friends, there wasn't any denomination behind me that patted me on the back and helped me at every turn of the road. I didn't know anybody but God. And God had spoken to me. And he stood up, and I'll never forget it. As I sat there, I started to sweat. My eyes were starting to fill with tears. And as he stood up, he looked around at the other pastors and said, if you have any wisdom, you will leave this place right now. And every one of them, one by one, stood up and left because I was in the room. Every single one of them, except the one guy who we met at his church, and he couldn't go, it was his church. <laughs> And I sat there, and I'll never forget the sweat on the outside and the tears running down my face. And now I'm in my car driving home, and I had to face my Debbie. I will never forget that. And I told Debbie about it, and she and I both couldn't believe what we had heard. She hugged me and held me, and I shook. And I went to God, and I said, God, this is not for me. I want to quit. I just want to give up. I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to be hurt anymore like that, God. I don't want to be embarrassed and ashamed like I was. God, let me out. And God said these words to me, no. I tell you, as clear as a bell, I still remember them. I need you to pastor. I never dreamt. I never dreamt in a million years. By the way, all of those men failed in their ministry. All of them. Every, uh, sadly, sadly, sadly. I'm not happy about that. Every single one of them failed in their ministry. God closed the door. But what was impressive to me is I would have been satisfied with 500 people in a church. I remember not too many years ago, just a few years ago, our accounting department came and we have someone who did nothing but membership. And she says, Pastor, there's about 24,000 people that attend this church. Now, it's not today because of the transition and because of freedom for the future. People don't want to stay when you raise money, especially for paying off the mortgage. So a lot of people left, thousands, tens of thousands of people left. And today, I'm here to tell you that God took this rejected person who left vindication and promotion to him and ex didn't know that God would take me further than I ever dreamt or expected here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. And since then, all, almost all of those denominations wanted to hook up with us. No way, Jose. My point being is this, God will take you further. Notice verse number 11. And then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And Jephthah spoke all the words before the Lord and Zephah. Those are the three things. I just want to give you, I, I'm running out of time. Real quick, Jeremiah 29, 11, for those who want a little verse for this. This ought to be your mantra. And let me read it to you. It says this, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future. Can you imagine God wanting us to have a future? Can you imagine that God would want us to have a hope beyond our own abilities and talents and insight and Intellect, can you imagine such a thing? A hope, that's God. 
You ought to say that to yourself every single day about God. You ought to write that down, make it your mantra for life. I've given you three things, and I told you none of those are any different, really, than anybody else in the Bible. But the fourth one is, the three things that reject is not the end. Vindication and promotions come from God. And God will take you further than you expected. Jeff reproves that to us. But was that enough to get him into Hebrews, the 11th chapter? I don't think so. But the next one is. I want you to know that Jephro makes a statement to God. He tries to talk the enemies from fighting with Israel. They, they want to fight. So he goes to God, in verse number 30, and he says this to God. God, I love this. If, he says, if you indeed deliver the people of Ammon, into my hands. Stop right there. If. Does that sound like much faith to you? It's kind of like the rest of us pray. I hope you do it, God. <laughs> and if you do, I'll make a deal with you. Can I tell you something? Let the people on television make a deal. God doesn't need your deal. You know, oftentimes, you do this for me. I'll do this. And I, you know, sometimes that's great. But I don't think he should. He makes a deal with God that becomes the stupidest deal in the whole world. Stupidest deal that broke his heart and cost him his lineage. Now watch this. Verse number 31, I think it is. He says this to God. He says that when I come home, that anybody that comes out or anything that comes out, I love this, it says whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me. Then I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. You say, well, what, what, that's kind of weird. What's that all about? Whatever comes out of his door. You have to understand, and even cultures in today, that people often live with their prized animals. You'll go into some of the <clears throat> Mideastern homes or African homes and you go in and there's a goat in there or there's, there's sheep in there or there's even cattle if they're great breeding animals and they're watched at night so that the, if you will, the beasts of the field don't eat them or the thieves that come and kill them. Oh my goodness. It's just amazing if... if it, it, that people live with. And he is obviously expecting his house that's full of these prize animals <clears throat> that he's captured from the rage that he's had that are protected inside of his house. When the door opens, they all run out. And when the first one out, wow, that one's going to be li lifted up as a burnt offering unto you. God, a burnt offering means the throat is slashed, the blood is poured out, and they're burned to cremation that there's nothing left. And it would cost him something, and he wanted it to cost him something. The problem with it is, when he gets home, and the door opens, he sees something completely different. In verse, if you will, in verse number 34, and Jephthah came to his house in Zephthah, and there his daughter coming out to meet him with tambourine and dancing. And she was his only child besides her. There had neither been son nor daughter. And in verse 35, and it came to pass when he saw, and he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you've brought me to great sorrow. And now he's faced with a vow. Here is point number four that I think is the most important today. Are you ready? Anybody ready? Yes. Point number four is simply this. Keep your commitments that you make to God. So many times we'll make a promise and not fulfill it. So many times we'll make a vow and not do anything about it. So many times we'll make a commitment and it just, well, that was a momentary thing. And then when we don't fulfill our vow, our commitment to God, here's what we say. Grace will cover us. Can I say this? Grace will cover you. But nowhere does it say grace will give you favor. Nowhere does it say that grace will get God's respect towards you. 
and you need favor and God's respect. You may have the sin wiped away by the grace of God of your failure to fulfill your commitment, but I'm here to tell you something right now. Listen closely. It won't get you the favor, nor will it get you the respect. How many times have we said when we got saved, God, I give you all my heart that was a vow a commitment a promise and then we go off doing our own thing I just made a commitment a stupid one like his first part of the year I was preaching at a church and I told the guy he had a great thing coming up and I told him I said man I'm going to send you ten thousand dollars Debbie kicked me under the table I think you know Debbie is, she, I don't know if she did or not but she she would go along with it she did not care but but gee ten thousand dollars and all this year, I haven't sent it yet. And then I come to this verse. Grace will cover me. But I need the respect and the favor more than the grace that covers me. Are you following me? And listen to what it says. His daughter comes. She goes, and she's so frustrated. She goes to the mountains for two months, comes back to meet her dad. And this verse I want to read to you, the 11th chapter, verse number 39. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to, to her father. And he carried out his vow. And he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man. And he became the custom in Israel. She became the custom for the women in Israel. Stop. I need to tell you something. You need to hear this. God does not accept human sacrifice. I don't care how much you love God, how much you're trying to impress God. God is not shown love nor impressed by human sacrifice. He even stopped, if you will. Abraham when he was going to slaughter and kill his child. He is not impressed with it. He is not moved by human sacrifice. There's two thoughts here. One thought is from many scholars that he didn't offer her up as a burnt offering sacrifice before the Lord and she was a virgin all of her life and never carried on the bloodline and his bloodline failed and stopped afterwards. But I'm of a different thought. I believe this is how he got into Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And here's why, because he fulfilled his vow and his commitment to God and offered her up. Now listen to me. The commitment was respected. The sacrificial offering was repugnant. And God hated the death of that girl, but loved the commitment of his promise. And what God is saying to us, and whether you believe it one way or the other, my friends, Trust me, this has been an argument in the church for years. That's why people never taught you about Jephthah. Is that some say he didn't offer her up because God doesn't accept it. Some say he did offer her up because it's what it says. He carried out his vow. I'm here to say I am not making that decision for you. You make the decision. You're smart enough. Just for me, for my own personal thinking, I think he offered her up. And the offering was repugnant to God. But the commitment to his promise was unrepentant. Unbelievable. And what we do oftentimes is we make promise and we never stay with our commitment. And that's the point of what God wants to do. Did you hear what I said? The offering of a human sacrifice is repugnant to God and unacceptable to God. Unacceptable. But the commitment of his promise is very Acceptable, especially in light of the pain that he had personally had to go through to fulfill it. Is anybody listening? Now, Debbie thinks completely opposite of me. She doesn't believe that he offered her up. And that's okay. But I think she did because that's the only thing that could have got him into Hebrews, the 11th chapter, was his commitment to his promise. My friends, today... We miss God a lot. 
because we try to do things our own way instead of his way. Today you learn something. Rejection is not the end. Stop listening to other people. Vindication, promotion, don't worry about it, it's coming from God. And then God will take you further than, I love that, than you ever expected. And number four, please keep your commitment to God. Yes, grace will cover you, but you need the favor and respect. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You do that?